This is the last episode in our video series on the life and career of F. W. de Klerk. We will deal with F. W. de Klerk's career after he left active polit politics in 1997 and his reminiscences during this period. F. W. de Klerk, the period of your retirement is now almost as long as your period in active politics. 25, through, yes. 25 years. What were your goals when you set out on the new business of not being a politician? I believe that I have a residual responsibility. Under my leadership, me and my party, and under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, the ANC, and all the other parties entered into a sacred agreement, encapsulated in the new constitution. I realized that this constitution would come under pressure. So I set myself the goal of continuing in some way or another to guard this constitution and to promote it, to make it a living document. I also decided to do an autobiography, which I did, called The Last Track, A New Beginning. And we started the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, dedicated to upholding the Constitution, to promoting it, to guard it against infringements and, and abuse of it, and to promote dialogue between the diversity of South Africa, to continue the good work of President Mandela regarding reconciliation. So we started it near the end of the previous century, and it's still going, and I hope it will go for many, many decades still after my departure. In 1999, you published the autobiography. Uh, what were the main points you wanted to make? What, what did you want to achieve with your autobiography? Was it an exercise in, in justifying your role? Or did you want to give a picture of how all of this had happened? Not at all to justify my role. Not at all self-aggrandizement. The purpose was to tell the story of the end of apartheid and the new beginning of a constitutional state and the story of my life, the story of all white South African, but through my eyes as, in a sense, their representative, so that there could be a deeper understanding why did we do what when why did we fail to do certain things at a certain time? To explain the mistakes that we made and to commemorate the wonderful thing which happened in South Africa, the miracle. The foundation, the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, has now been operating for 22 years. What do you think its main contributions have been? I think we made many contributions. We worked in phases. In the first phase, we continued to promote dialogue with the ANC. On at least three occasions, we went to the bush. President Mbeki played along, brought some of his ministers. We brought our board and some influential opinion makers. And there we, we, we tried to lay a foundation <clears throat> for continued dialogue, for continued close cooperation. Whether we succeeded or not, it's an open question. Uh, after those occasions, where we met in, in isolation with each other, I felt, yes, it was good that we did it. 
but it didn't last. The ANC went off the rails when Mbeki went was sent away and demobilized by by his peers. One of the things that you wanted to achieve during the dialogue was to get clarification on the ANC's transformation policies and to try to come to some kind of agreement on how policies like black economic empowerment and affirmative action could be implemented with the cooperation of all of the parties. But somehow there was never a, a concrete response from the ANC on this. True, true. The ANC had its own agenda, I think, which they didn't disclose to us. And it was always a touchy subject to discuss affirmative action or black economic empowerment with them. And if we look back now, we see what that agenda was. One of the issues that the foundation championed was the idea of continuing uh, tuition in Afrikaans at at least some of our universities. And the foundation organized conferences that wrote a lot of articles on this. But now, in 2021, Afrikaans at university level appears to be under huge pressure. What do you think has gone wrong? I think it's even more than pressure. It is disappearing. Only at my alma mater at Potsdam is there still one of their three campuses where Afrikaans is the predominant language. As Stellenbosch, Afrikaans has been maneuvered into to the back burner. Uh, Stellenbosch is for all practical purposes also an English university now. What has gone wrong? I think pressure from the ANC, weak leadership from the universities, uh, a lack of support from the private sector. They weren't so concerned about excellence is now the only word. Excellence can be achieved through mother tongue education better than in any other way. That educational principle has been pushed into a corner. But it's true. I did all my studies in Africa. Everything. But I mastered English, studied English at school and at university, used it in my, league, in my law practice, used it in my political career, and I'm reasonable now in the language. But you master English, the world language, and you use your natural talents and what you've learned in your own language to good effect in the competitive world. So what went wrong is the importance of mother tongue education has been ignored, has been shunted into a corner, and South Africa is the poorer for that. The ANC has a terrible track record with regard to the constitutional provision that all indigenous languages must also be promoted. I see there's an effort now uh, at some, in some quarters to, to try and rectify that, I think, in Zulu. But it's bad and it makes us poor. Now, although you left active politics in 1997, you continued to be a loyal supporter of the new National Party. What did you think about the NNP's decision to link up with the DA, uh, or in fact, in fact with the DP as it then was, the Democratic Party, to form the Democratic Alliance? I, I welcomed it in one sense of the word, but I was concerned about it in another sense of the word. They should have tried first to link up, yes, but not to unify into one party. They, that should have developed naturally. They should have retained initially their identities 
and entered into a cooperative agreement of some sort of another. Something like that. But it was also always my vision that the National Party, whether you call it the New National Party or the National Party, would not on its own obtain a majority and would have to become more and more representative of the whole population. The DP was also white like the National Party used to be. But after the 1994 election, the National Party was the most diverse party of all parties in the country with regard to its support base. It extended far beyond whites and Afrikaners. We had 50%, more than 50% of the Indian vote, more than 50% of the brown vote, and about 600,000 black supporters. So it was a step in the right direction, but the step was not taken in a, in a proper way. Well, your successor, Martinus van Skalkweg, uh, tried to increase the support of uh, his party, uh, the new national party, among black South Africans. But the more he tried to move into the center, the more he, he opened up his flank to the, the, the Democratic Party, to Tony Leon. And uh, the, as a result of this, the National Party support declined dramatically from the 1994 election to the 1999 election and finally to the 2004 election. Then in 2004, after the breakup of the marriage with the, with the DP within the DA, the National Party took the decision to join and amalgamate with the ANC. What did you think about that? Scandalous. Scandalous. The National Party was disbanded without having a National Congress to take that decision. It was merely done by the head committee uh, within the old supporters of the National Party from my time. There was great, great concern about the way in which Martinez van Skogweg handled that. To disband the party and go up into the ANC was against everything. It left a vacuum. The National Party was a party slightly right of center, fully non-racial, but based on certain values and principles. The DP is more a liberal party in international political terms. The National Party was more a conservative party in international terms. And instead of merging and bringing the best of those values under one roof with the DA, the National Party lost its course. And that resulted in people losing its trust in it. And yes, the results were bad in 99, and the National Party was like a dead fish in the water. But you were not, you were interested not only in South African politics, uh, you had actually become a, a global figure. And in 2004, together with a number of other former leaders, you decided to establish the Global Leadership Foundation, which had its headquarters in London. Can you tell us something about this initiative and, and what happened to the GLF and what it's doing now? It's still there, it's still active. Somebody came to me, a friend from South Africa, who was working for BP, and his job was to negotiate with governments when new oil was discovered to try and secure rights for BP. And he came to me and said, you know, in all my dealings with these heads of state, I find that especially in the developing world and the underdeveloped world, there are some good leaders, but they don't know how to do the right thing. They don't have a strong civil service with good experience to advise them. They're surrounded by crooks 
and by corrupted people. And they need objective good advice about how to govern better. And I will give you some seed money. Why don't you consider starting an organization which can do that? It ended up with the establishment of the GLF, the Global Leadership Foundation, where we've brought together initially about 12. There are now 44 of us. Former presidents, former prime ministers, former cabinet ministers, former very senior diplomats, all with clean records, clean hands, all retired, nobody holding political office. And what we do is we give objective advice to governments in all parts of the world. And my members, these 44 come from all countries in the world, from all regions in the world. It's fully representative of the global spread of diversity. And what we do is we engage with a government which we feel need advice. We have to arrange for an invitation to send a team. Then we send a small team of three or four of our members based on horses for courses, language, sometimes religion might play a role and so on. And they sit down with that head of government and analyze with him the challenges his or her country faces. And give some advice and offer ongoing advice if they require it. And in many instances we did. What distinguishes us from others in this regard is we give confidential advice. We don't go in with TV teams and say, here we are, you need advice, here's your advice. We keep it between us unless they prepare to let it be known that we were involved. So I can't give you examples, but two I can, where we were involved, because it has become public knowledge. In Colombia, we were deeply involved. And a few years back in Mozambique, we were deeply involved in getting the uh, governing party and the opposition party to put away their access and to start operating a sort of normal democracy. One of the, the issues you probably had to deal with was the fact that many national leaders actually feel quite isolated. They can't always trust the advice of people around them because everybody's got uh, some or other issue they want to promote. And so the idea was also that you would have this group that would be representative, but that wouldn't have an agenda. Exactly. To totally objective. But yes, we are based on values. We believe in democracy. We believe in the rule of law. We believe in well-balanced economic policies. So, but my members come from all sorts of European parties. In London, for instance, from the Conservative and the Labour Party. So yes, you're right, they become isolated and they need objective advice from people without any agenda whatsoever. During this period, you've also played a leading role in the annual summits, world summits of Nobel Peace Laureates. I think that you have attended summits all over the world, you've, in Rome, in uh, Barcelona and Paris, Berlin, Hiroshima, Bogota, Merida in Mexico. Chicago. Chicago. What has your experience been of interacting with all of these other Nobel Peace Laureates? It's been good. Some of them are very impressive people. Some of them represent organizations which were given the prize. Red Cross, European Union, etc. So it's a high level group of people, all of them having done something special in their lives. That's why they've been elected. So they bring to the table a wide diversity of views 
and we'd had wonderful debates when all the Nobel laureates met privately. But usually these events also went hand in hand, reaching out to the youth, opening up to the public and large audiences of thousands of people sometimes listened to us in panel discussions and the like. It was really worthwhile how much influence we exerted on the world scene. That is doubtful. But uh, you also got to know people like uh, Gorbachev. What were your impressions of Gorbachev? You became friends, I think. Huh? We became good friends. He actually started this organization. It was his initiative together with an assistant of his. And it has grown into something wonderful. He and I could really get along well. Uh, just don't give him a microphone, he speaks forever. <laughs> but he's a good man, he's a wise man. And uh, I like him as a person. And, and also Lech Walesa of Poland. Uh, yes, yeah. he's, he's a character. But I like him too. And uh, in, his, in our younger days, we would have a vodka together from time to time. During the past 25 years, you and your wife, Alita, have traveled extensively to every corner of the world virtually. You've made speeches, you've met leaders. What has your experience been of South Africa's changing image in the international community? I think we started off uh, as being the, 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 the global flavor of the month. We were the most popular country in the world. How have things developed since then? Unfortunately, not in the right direction. Yes, we were the flavor of the month. Yes, we were the country where something special has happened. Yes, we were the country where a miracle occurred. And the doors, all doors were wide open to us. Unfortunately, we did not use those doors judiciously. And as the shine went off and we became, yes, a normal democracy, a constitutional state, part of the international community, the special attention dropped and it, we became, yes, just another country, an important one in Africa, therefore still playing a special role. But with bad government back home, with re-racializing in Zuma's time, the political debate in South Africa, and how things are managed, with kicking former allies in the teeth and embracing new allies with the move away from Europe almost to a great extent and the embracing of China. We lost that sympathy. And now we compete with all other countries in the world. And we're not doing too well at the moment. And then Finally, um, what is it like stepping down from being a head of state, a president with power and the ability to make decisions, uh, and then after just a, a few years to be a private citizen? How did you make that transition? And have you found happiness in the 25 years since then? Well, I was never sort of too excited about being a president. Yes, you have power. We also have power as a minister. So I was used, when I say do something, it's done. And I could really influence things. And I really could make a difference and made a difference. It took some adaptation. But I was ready for it. One should never overstay. I don't believe one should be in one senior position longer than six or seven years. 
then you become stale and you start defending what you initiated instead of carrying on with reform and carrying on with the management of church. So it was my time to go. And I found happiness in, on the, if you can call it, professional side, in the work that I've done and that we've done in the F.W. de Klerk Foundation. I find fulfillment in the Global Leadership Foundation. But I found great happiness also in my private life. Uh, I'm happily married. We're a close unit. And I have so much to be thankful for. So I keep my interest alive, but I don't try to be Mr. Former President all the time.